welcome to the Psychedelic Diaries. I am your host, Ray Krishna. Mm. Do we have a show for you today? We will be joined momentarily by Peter Vander Hayden, Chief Science Officer of SciGen for a deep dive and a soul search. Of course, we'll start the show with a nugget and a noodle. <laughs> and please subscribe to the show because these psychedelic drugs aren't going to trip themselves. Producer Kevin is here, and let's get started with a nugget and a noodle. And today's news nugget is that Washington, D.C., my hometown, has decriminalized magic mushrooms and other plant medicine. It's not exactly news. It was a year ago when the vote occurred. And yet, for some reason, it's flown under the radar. And yet, using, growing, or even gifting magic mushrooms in the nation's capital is fine. And companies are working the loophole. For instance, you can buy paper prints or quote-unquote artwork for $70 and receive a free gift of an eighth of magic mushrooms. And in related news, producer Kevin has gotten a lot of new artwork lately. <laughs> and as for the noodle, at a philosophical level, is it better to be the squeaky wheel that gets the grease or walk softly and carry a big stick? Now, in the psychedelic industry, we have some companies that seem like press release machines. And then we have others that are quietly rolling up their sleeves and doing work, like perhaps our next guest. So what is the better path? I suppose time will tell, but for my money, I kind of prefer the latter. And that's it for the nugget and a noodle. Ladies and gentlemen, if I may direct your attention, he is the chief science officer of SciGen, Peter Vander Hayden. Thank you for joining the show. All right. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for the introduction. I uh, really look forward to this chat. Me too. Good to have you. So, Peter, I love the new website at SciGen, the team as well, and of course, this niche of being one of the core manufacturers. And as you've had experience now at SciGen for, I believe, a couple of years, you've seen the evolution of your company and the psychedelic industry. What has surprised you? In this industry, well, the industry is very young, so it, there's almost been no time to be surprised. Things are moving so quickly. Uh, there's little time to reflect even. So, you know, it's one of these things where you have to stop yourself and go, is this really happening? The fact that it is happening is what's surprising. You know, that, that four years ago, five years ago, I would have sat here and you would have said, hey, five years from now, this is what you're going to be doing. This is what's going to be happening. I would have said, no, it's not possible. You know, we've lived 50 years of prohibition where these things were demonized and marginalized. Um, you know, people put away for doing stuff with this that, you know, before the war on drugs started, there had been a lengthy, uh, you know, good amount of time with solid research and these things weren't illegal. And then next thing you know, 50 years of prohibition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 50 years of prohibition, four years of this being out in the open, uh, little time to reflect. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's easy sometimes to have hot takes and to, to complain. And it seems like we're in a time of hand wringing and finger pointing and complaining. And that I think also has affected psychedelic industry. And yet to your point, it's like just the very fact that there is this industry now is cause for a celebration. So I'm with you on that. Stepping away from psychedelics, just briefly, Peter, uh, you told me once that you thoroughly enjoy studying the mountains of Canada and you're an outdoorsy guy. And I'm curious, what have the mountains taught you? Yeah, well, you know, just to have your listeners be clear, I'm, I'm not trained as a, you know, as a chemist. So chief science officer for Sajan and lead chemist in this company. Uh, my training actually is, um, is in uh, earth science. So I'm a geologist. I have a PhD in geology. I specialized in uh, geochronometry, which is dating the rocks. Um, you know, not quite the same as dating, uh, you know, my girlfriend, but, uh, you know, we dating the rocks, finding out how old they are. So I use geochronometry as a tool for pinning down the the time element in geology. You know, geology is a very 
three-dimensional uh, science. You're studying, you know, how the mountains, are, you know, the structure of the mountains and things like that. But the time element is very important. So it's, you know, as a geologist, I kind of worked in four dimensions and I was very focused on this element of time. Now, how old are the mountains? How did they get there? You know, in, in what sequence did things happen? Um, you know, the main thing the mountains taught me and, you know, being out in the wilderness, I had the opportunity for decades to uh, work out in true wilderness, hundreds of miles from the nearest person, you know, with full mm. modern support, helicopter support, radio support, but out there in environments where in the last 10,000 years, nobody had set foot. So you, you get to spend time in places where there's a certain, you know, there's a certain quiet there, you know, nobody's been there. And, and so there's no imprint of, of human presence. And what that taught me is that we live on an undiscovered planet. Now, mm -hmm. as people in our societies, we run around, we often don't even, we're not aware that there's a sky over our head. Uh, you know, we don't spend enough time looking up at the night sky and realizing what a small speck we are in this vast universe. Mm -hmm. um, so, so being out there taught me things like that. It gives, it gives a real sense of perspective, not just in space, but you know, being focused on time, also in, in, in time. And, and so it puts things in, in a real perspective. What we're doing here as human beings started only a very short time ago. And as a geologist, I'm all too aware that it'll be over very soon, geologically speaking. There's no doubt about that. We are not going to survive as a species. That would be unique in the evolution. Of, of, of this planet, this is not going to last. So in a sense, that makes it all the more precious. And so, you know, this, this you know, leaning deeply into the nature of our environment, where we are, the place we are, you know, which in a, in a you know, in, in psychedelics, we often talk about set and setting. Well, this is the ultimate setting, uh, you know, and you place it in time and space and it gives you a real sense of, what is important and what isn't. So, you know, there are many lessons to be learned from being out in the wilderness. And it, it also happened to be the environment where I gained most of my experience with these substances. That's where I like to trip. Uh, and there are many things to be learned by being in an environment where there are very few people. I love that. I, you were recently nominated for one of these uh, person of the year at the microdose conference. I went to the meet Delic conference, which was a couple of days ago as well. And beforehand I went and tripped at Red Rock uh, at the state park outside Vegas. And I had kind of a similar concept of the relationship of time and, and space where it felt like, like if you are a God that being in the now is, is kind of hard to do in a way because you've got this, the vastness, this infinity of time and, and to be in the now is, it just seems like it's a lot easier to do when you're out in nature and you see that there's this tree, this plant, this mountain that they just sit here all day and eat sunlight and survive and just be. And it's kind of comforting to see actually. And then it seems like when you're on a trip, it's, it's just brought home even harder than when you're out there, uh, not on a trip, but either way, being out there, I think there's something to it. And I'm curious, you mentioned your preferred place to trip, being outdoors. You have one of the most fascinating psychedelic journeys, I think, um, of anybody in this industry. And for me, my discovery of the impact of psychedelics on specifically, Peter, cognition and creativity, and maybe even purpose has changed the trajectory of my life. And I'm curious, what has been your journey with psychedelics and maybe a little uh, cherry on top at the end is how has that affected your leadership at SciGen? Well, I wouldn't be sitting here if I'd never encountered psychedelics. Uh, mm. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd probably still be doing geology out in the mountains, which wouldn't be a bad thing. It's, mm. you know, it, it, it was a great career. Um, the, for me, and I imagine it's this way for many people in this space, um, my, my first experience was life transforming. Uh, it, it really set the tone for everything I'm doing in 
and in some ways that are that to me are still very mysterious. It's you know there are synchronicities and 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 that have happened that make me wonder, uh, you know, how. Like for instance, let, let me give an example. I, my 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 first journey happened to be with the uh, 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 LSD that was made in the late '60s and early '70s um, by a man by the name of uh, Nick Sand, actually Nick Sand and Tim Scully, uh, and that LSD was called Orange Sand. It was these little orange barrels. Uh, uh, you know, they were anywhere from 200 to 300 micrograms. So they were, you know, good doses, uh, you know, true psychedelic doses. And uh, I guess I was fortunate enough to, despite all my fears at the time, that uh, this would make me jump out of a window or think I could fly, um, uh, that, of which, of course, it never did. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to have that experience. And in the, in the aftermath, my amazement that it was even possible that this experience could be had and that <laughs> somebody had made this um, inspired me very briefly uh, to, to want to meet the person that had done this it, because it was just such, such an amazing thing. Um, well, I was young. There were lots of distractions. I probably forgot about it. And then through a complete, and this was in Holland, I grew up in Holland. Um, and then through a completely unrelated set of events and circumstances, uh, 20 years later, almost exactly 20 years later, I ended up meeting this man and actually working with him. <laughs> um, so, you know, you kind of have to wonder if you plant this, you know, a seed of just a simple thought, which which then you forget, but maybe is lodged somewhere in uh, either in the brain or somewhere in the universe. It's hard to say that 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 something like that would will come to pass. And that you know, so so collectively, those all of that changed my life because that set me on a path of getting very interested in psychedelic chemistry. And um, so from that point on, from from 1993 on, I devoted my uh, learning about these molecules and how to make them um, and the science around that. And so that's become my second career after being a geologist. And um, uh, I'm now applying that uh, with SciGen. Many of the things that I've learned over the years in a let's say a context of unauthorized research, uh, that that might be a good way of putting it. Um, I'm now implementing at SciGen. Uh, you know, we couldn't publish what we discovered. You know, there was real science going on. Uh, we 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 took this seriously. We were making pharmaceuticals. Now it wasn't in a GMP context, but the care we put into it and the love we put into it was certainly. Uh, you know, of of the, of a caliber to produce extremely pure um, LSD and other psychedelics. And what we learned in the process, because there's always this wanting to improve. So, you know, you never stop learning. You never stop improving. You know, if you have a passion for something, there's no end point. You're always going to mm -hmm. get better at something. You're always going to make new discoveries. And some of those discoveries are now being implemented in the way we make these molecules today. And, you know, now we're doing it in a GMP context and, you know, fully regulated and licensed, but things that, you know, hopefully now some of the things we discovered then can be published now. And, you know, some, 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 some beautiful research happened that can now see the light of day and, and help people where it's not within this context of illegality. Wow. Thank you for that share. And if I may, let me just say thank you, Peter, for being one of those guys. I think you and I are aligned on this idea with Thomas Jefferson, that if a law is unjust, it is not just your right, but also your duty to break it. And you took that to a, a, another level. And I was I actually watched that uh, after we first connected, I watched that movie about Nick Sand on uh, Netflix or wherever it was. And I kept hoping and expecting to see you in there at some point. But for you to go out there and be tip of the spear, 
and be bold. And it's one of those things where it's like, in order to know where the line is, sometimes you have to fucking cross the line. And I thank you for being one of the guys that, that did what you did. And uh, I really liked your idea of planning an idea in your own thought, in your head or in the universe and having it come to fruition later. It does seem like that happens quite a bit where you want something to happen or you want someone or something to change and you can share your ideas or thoughts. And it might take decades for it to actually, for that thought to bloom. And it sounds like that really happened for you. And what a fun time, what a fun career arc you've had. And uh, switching gears a little bit to the other side of the psychedelic coin. One thing I've noticed in the many sessions I've been lucky enough to engage is that even as I've gotten quite experienced, Peter, I'm still a little bit scared going into each one. And you know, every then I do it, and then I'm like, "Wow, why was I scared? This was this was obviously lovely and incredible." And sometimes they are challenging, but I always found those are those are the deep cleanings that that needed to happen. But I'm curious for you, Peter, what is the hardest part of let's say large dose psychedelic use for you? Well, let me first address the fear, the fear part. I think fear is healthy. Mm. You know, the, 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 these are. These are states of mind that are extraordinary. And I, you know, I think fear, um, you know, is, is actually a healthy attitude to have, you know, being cavalier about this and diving in can, can have consequences that, uh, that can be disastrous. And so, so fear can also make you, you know, approach this with care. Uh, so, you know, I don't think fear is bad at all. And, uh, yeah, even if you've done, you know, numerous times you've gone, why was I afraid? I don't need to be afraid. It happened. Same for me. Um, I don't think that's anything unusual. We know, we know how to deal with this. We know about set and setting and dosage and purity. Uh, so we can mitigate many things, but, you know, you have to recognize that, that the psyche and, uh, you know, unleashing the full um there's your know, reality has a dark side mm. uh, you know the light and the dark are two sides of one coin and so uh you know expecting that it'll all be light and that you're not going to encounter both on a personal level and on a transpersonal level things that are very difficult to deal with and very difficult to experience and go through um you know, it's one of the things about these these therapies that are being developed. I sometimes wonder whether the therapists are equipped to deal when the dark side of the psyche comes out in full force. You know, you have to be prepared. And uh, so I think that's, you know, that's, that's just addressing the fear. Um, you know, another aspect of that fear, it's interesting, is, is uh, you were talking about unjust laws. And these laws, you know, this prohibition... Uh, that started in, uh, you know, with Richard Nixon, I think it was back in 68, where public enemy number one was drugs. Yes. You know, that was inspired by fear. Mm. Um, and, and you know, I think it's helpful, you know, it, it might be helpful to not look at this as that, that, that dr yes, draconian measures were implemented and, and put in, put in place, but, but it was inspired by fear. And, best way to address fear in the long run is with compassion. You know, I think, I think demonizing fear, it'll just have serious blowback. And so we have to recognize this fear element and we have to somehow or other be able to address it and, and rather than, you know, push it under the rug. If you, if you ignore the dark side, you know, you, you, you might pay a heavy price. So. This light and dark, this, this paradoxical yin and yang and that, that's reality needs both and to, to not run from one or the other. It also kind of reminds me of for my money. I'm curious to get your take on this, but I don't think there is such a thing as a bad trip. I think there are tough trips and I would call it a deep cleaning. Like if you don't go to the dentist for a long time, it's going to hurt in all likelihood. And if you haven't addressed some stuff up here in the old noggin for a while, like it's probably going to hurt. You probably got some skeletons to clean out of that closet. and one specific experience I had, Peter, recently, 
if you don't mind trying to take a, a stab at describing uh, the ineffable, I'd love to hear one uh, experience that comes to mind. For me, one recently I alluded to it was when I was tripping out in Red Rock uh, this past weekend. And I had this moment where it was just me on the top of this little mountain and um, this, this maybe an epiphany, it sounds kind of simple and almost cliche now uh, as I try to describe it, but I felt that when you are truly in the moment, especially as something that is subjectively beautiful is occurring uh, or while something beautiful is occurring, if you are truly in the universe, it's almost as if you are giving God or the universe an unfiltered chance to enjoy its creation. And, and as I, when that struck me, that idea struck me, I tried to get up and, and grab my phone and write down a note so I wouldn't forget it, which is always hilarious because then it's like, it's always burned in my brain. How could I forget it? But as I was trying to type it just in my note to remember it later, the, the idea hit me so hard, I, I, I could not stop weeping. <laughs> and uh, because the idea just hit me so deeply. And um, I've, had, I've been really just noodling on that concept of late. And I'm curious, Peter, for you, what is a, a transcendent or profound experience that, that you can recall? Oh, my goodness. Um, well... There's, there's, there's one where, um, well, let's say you know, there, there are overlaps between psychedelic experience and deep meditative states that you can reach through, through, through meditation. Um, I had one experience where I had, this, this was uh, on uh, psilocybin mushrooms uh, in Mexico. I was, uh, visiting the ruins at Palenque. Hmm. And I was wandering around in the forest behind the ruins, found a beautiful stream and waterfall and sat down. And what started happening was this, this insight that, uh, you know, it's maybe, maybe the Zen concept of not doing. And so I, I got into this space, this mind state where I realized that the less I did, which is itself not a doing, it's, it, you know, this is a, a paradox, but the less I did, <laughs> and, and, and the, more, uh, the more I went into that space of not doing, which included not thinking either, not following the thoughts, but just going into this deep quiet, um, I, I ended up in this incredible clarity and this incredible feeling of peace and, 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 and clarity. And it just went deeper and deeper as if, you know, you end up in a state um, of, 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 of real contentment that, uh, you know, about nothing in particular, <laughs> there was nothing to really to hang that on. And it, it, it gets simpler, but deeper and more profound. And, it wasn't necessarily a psychedelic experience. There wasn't all these bells and whistles and all this stuff going on. It was just this state of really deep presence in the, in, in the moment. And I'd never experienced that, uh, you know, so profoundly and, and with such simplicity. Um, and, and that really stands out because you can have, you know, the psychedelic experience can take you into all these places where there is so much going on and it can be, you know, both overwhelmingly terrifying and overwhelmingly beautiful. Uh, but in a sense, you know, it's almost like those are distractions. This um, ability, that, you know, that, that we obviously have inherent in us as, as, as living beings. It's, you know, it's not the drug that puts that in you. It just allows you to experience what what you know? What the potential you already have, hmm. but but just that 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 simple ability to be present, um, and how profound that is, and that is something that is not easy to put into words because you know the experience itself has no words. <laughs> so you know people might go stretch ahead. What's he talking about and whatnot? But but that really was actually one of the most profound experiences I've ever had. Ah, that is beautiful. This idea of really complete deep presence and it was almost like a i don't know like a a rabbit hole where you couldn't the more the deeper you got the more 
in the presence you got and there was no actual arrival it was just this process of complete presence even though you weren't doing anything oh that's that's really that's really cool um so okay we could probably wax eloquent about some interesting experiences for about, hours. about our personal experiences yes <laughs> yeah, and to be honest, yeah i wish yeah. i could do a show of just that at some point um, we're segueing away from where you want to go. <laughs> where, where do you want to go? Well, we're segueing away because you are one of my favorites in this industry, Peter, and just in the space. And your takes are so cogent and clear and compelling. And um, let's just imagine a thought experiment where you are the drug czar, Canada, US, North America, whatever. And people have access if they want. And let's say some legalization occurs. But of course, there's going to be a lot of people that are skeptical. And I'm curious, for those that are on the fence about psychedelics, what would you tell them? Well, I would say that the attitude of checking this out, you know, being evidence-based is, is, is the right way to go. Um, that, you know, if someone's skeptical, then... Uh, as long as they're open to uh, information and and uh, objective data and you know rational thought, uh, then there's room to uh, you know explore possibilities. So as long as there's you know as long as this skepticism isn't a closed-mindedness, uh, I think skepticism is good. Um, but how do you open that up? Hmm. And and um, uh, you know, it's 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 a question of education. It's going to be a question of um, partly, you know, exposing the misconceptions and the lies because there have been lies around this. You know, a lot of this was politically based. Yes. And uh, and and you know, the, this has to be set aside. So so I think one of the first things that I try and do is to encourage um, the the possibility to ask the question, is it possible that these substances might actually have medical benefit? You know, because they're classified as having no medical benefit. And we now, you know, we know that that's not the case. I mean, that is now, you know, quite well documented and demonstrated. So, so start with what we already know and, and, and bring that into the picture and then expand on that. And, uh, check it out with an open mind, you know, not with this preconception that it might actually uh, be beneficial, but also not with the preconception that it's, it has no benefit. Uh, so, so, you know, it calls for an open mindedness. And we've, we've lived now for 50 years under this closed minded approach that obviously isn't working and is so much damage. You know, I'm not talking here about psychedelics there. You know, psychedelics are almost like in, in the, in the context of prohibition, psychedelics have been roadkill on the drug superhighway. It's like they're 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 a minor, you know, aspect of 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 a, of, of a much larger problem. Uh, and I think it would help to be able to set psychedelics aside from that, to bring them away from the same as you know the the bigger drug war, the true large drug war of you know cocaine and and methamphetamine and and uh, and opiates, um, you know, which itself, you know, th th there should be no war on these drugs because ultimately that's a war on people and the people that suffer from that are, you know, they they don't deserve that. So, uh, but but split off psychedelics, they're a very different class of substance, you know, uh, calling them any of these different classes of substances and lumping them all together under drugs and then having a knee-jerk reaction of drugs bad, you know, that's one of the first things that I try um, to, to argue. And of course, this, is, this, is, this has been going on for a long time. Um, you know, the one person who's worked on that diligently and uh, the longest is, is uh, you know, probably is Rick Doblin, um, you know, who's persisted for 30 years and is now, you know, arguably uh, experiencing, uh, you know, the, the, the success of that. Um, you know, so, you know, I, I, I defer to him almost for, you know, being 
the right person, the right spokesperson to, uh, I, I'd nominate him for drug czar. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. And what a, what a good take. And, um, it's like uh, Yuval Harari in his book, Sapiens, talked about this idea of myths. And we are a culture built on myths that are very effective in a lot of ways. In religions, you could put it as an example of a myth, but any ideology is also a myth. It's a thing we all agree on, and then it becomes real because we agree on it. And he says this interesting concept that you can't get rid of a myth. You can't just say, all right, we, we debunked it, it's gone. You actually have to replace it. And it feels like that may apply here and psychedelics, where there is this myth that it's you know lumped in with other drugs and it can do so much damage because of the Nixon, because of the 50 years of prohibition. And it's almost like we need to find the right myth to replace that old, outdated one. And I think we're getting close to that. And some of those thoughts, as you just articulated, I think can can do a lot in that in that vein. And it's funny when you talk about the big experiences, Peter, and the profound and the big picture stuff, it's it's like a joke. I, one, one idea I have where it's like, well, I met God on one of the trips. And like, I came out of that trip being like, oh my God, I need to like shout it from the mountaintop and go to everybody. Look, everybody, hold on a second. And I want to tell you about, it. I met God. And I remembered like, when I meet anybody, that doesn't work. You have to start with, hey, Peter, how are you doing? What's going on? And you have to be back and you deal with parking tickets and the DMV and bills and life. And you can't just go right to, oh, my God, there is a God. And you have to get to the real stuff. Speaking of which, of real stuff and, and the day to day, I'm going to talk a little bit more about SciGen. I think you might be my favorite company in the entire space. And I don't say that lightly. I've gotten to meet a lot of the companies and a lot of the, the real innovators through this podcast. And I think you're number one. And um, you've got the state of the art manufacturing facility. You've got uh, finally an ability to work legally in this space. You've got the dealer's license, I think either coming soon or, or, or already you've got it. And you, you have an ability also to work with your daughter, which got, that has to be a really cool experience. And the corporate roadmap is also just quite simply titillating. Peter, what is coming up for SciGen that's got you excited? Well, clearly a huge milestone is going to be um, once we're uh, operating under license. Uh, at the moment, we are operating, but you know we can't make restricted substances at this point. Um, uh, we're already active. We're you know th there are a couple substances that aren't regulated in Canada. Five uh, meo DMT is one of them. Ibogaine is another. Um, so at least we can be working on our uh, drug development for those and and. Uh, um, move through the kind of work that you need to do to get to a point and call these substances uh, uh, GMP compliant, um, which is a whole process where you, you know, you have to do first experimental work, then development work to demonstrate that you can make uh, each batch uh, consistent and uh, have a robust method that, that lends itself to uh, you know, you can reproduce it every time. You can have the same quality. Um, then the methods need to be validated. And you have to go through this whole process to uh, to, to, to make uh, GMP compliant materials. Um, what is so GMP for those that don't know? Oh, GMP stands for Good Manufacturing Practices, which means that you are operating under a set of guidelines that, uh, that have been drafted by the regulators, and this is now uh, harmonized across jurisdictions. So, you know, the guidelines are pretty much the same in Europe and in the United States and in Canada, in the Western world anyway. Um, and uh, the, the whole concept is one where you don't make a substance and then test its quality after the fact and say, okay, this material is pure, so it's good enough to go into, uh, you know, into a market or be, be, uh, be used uh, by human beings. Uh, you build quality in from the start. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole process where you, you, you develop a method and, and, and you work your way through that, uh, that, that development and validation process so that you know from the very beginning that you're going to end up with that quality. It's not an after the fact analysis. 
you build it in from the start. And that that's not just your chemistry. It's, you know, this applies to equipment, this applies to personnel, this applies to the facility itself. It applies to your supply chain. The entire thing is within the framework of a quality management system. And this is new for me. Of course, in the past, I've, you know, we've made some very good uh, psychedelics, but we, you know, the, the quality was tested after the fact. So this is a different way of working. It's a different way of thinking. Um, it's not light bedtime reading, you know, to work your way through these, these, these guidelines. Um, <laughs> but it's uh, now that I understand the necessity of this and uh, as a framework, it also really helps you be organized. You know, they, they, hmm. they, these are complex processes, complex facilities. There are so many moving parts that it's easy to get lost in the details. And, so working under a quality, uh, quality management system uh, provides a lot of guidance and, and, and framework. So now from something that I was resisting, uh, it's becoming fun, you know, because I recognize the, the, uh, the need to do it this way. Uh, and, you know, we want to make these substances and we want to provide them to people. Uh, and so uh, I'm starting to see the value of these um complex guidelines that you know people have put so much effort and energy into developing these guidelines for the pharmaceutical industry that uh, i'm becoming a fan uh, you know where before i would have said my work my way through all this paperwork uh but i see the need for it now and uh so 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 I, i'm actually excited about that working within a framework that uh you know the the, the, the you know, that, that ensures safety and it ensures efficacy. Um, uh, you know, it's all for safety. These things were developed, let's say, for example, uh, thalidomide, which, of course, you know, was a drug that was used, um, uh, you know, for legitimate purposes. And uh, but there were problems that resulted in, um, you know, these thalidomide babies. And um, so it was after. Uh, problems like that, that the pharmaceutical industry uh, became subject to uh, oversight by the regulator. Um, and as a result, uh, you know, I mean, the regulator cares about people. They, they, they want to make sure that these things are safe. And, um, so it's actually exciting to be working within that framework and to be working with the regulator. And, uh, uh, you know, so of course, you know, my big love is, is, is working at the bench and making these molecules. Uh, but the new things, the new things I'm learning here are, are, are uh, it's, 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 it's actually a lot of fun. I like that idea that you changed your mind on your approach towards the regulations and the red tape. It reminds me of um, this, this quote I heard about as I was changing my morning routine and really adding a bunch of steps and habits into that routine. This Navy SEAL uh, named Jocko talked about this idea that a routine is, is actually freeing because once you've got the routine, you don't have to spend any time thinking about it. And then now you have more time to think about the next step and the next innovation. And I found that in my mornings and it sounds like you're finding that with your production quick follow-up before we transition to the soul search. What do you think, or what do you know is harder to make LSD or psilocybin? Psilocybin. Handsome. Yeah. It's much more, it's, it's, Although LSD may look like a more complex molecule, it's actually easier to make. Uh, psilocybin is a complex, it, it's a simple molecule, you know, a simple small molecule, but it's, uh, of all the psychedelics, it's the more difficult one to make, of all the classical psychedelics. No kidding. Oh, that's I fascinating. could go into the technicalities of that, but it is, it is complex. Now, you know, there have been some amazing developments in recent years. There's been a revolutionary breakthrough in one step of the psilocybin synthesis that was uh, uh, published uh, last year by USONA, by the chemists at USONA, a very skilled group of chemists. Um, hats off to them. They, they are doing amazing work, and they've made it possible um, because of their policy, they've made it possible for us to develop uh, our own version of what they published hmm. uh, into a into a truly scalable method, where you know before when we were trying to optimize the synthesis for psilocybin about two years ago, 
Um, one of the steps uses reagents that are dangerous and very hard to handle. And yeah, you could make batches of, uh, you know, maybe maximum a few hundred grams, but scaling it to something where you can make one kilo or five kilos or 50 kilos at a time, uh, you know, which are the kind of amounts that are going to be needed down the road if a commercial market opens up, you need a scalable method. So you might have a synthesis that was developed in a research lab that lends itself well for one or two grams, but it'd be very dangerous and difficult to then scale that up. And so, you know, these considerations for scale up were serious with psilocybin. And um, that was resolved by the chemists at, um, at USONA. Um, actually, as a side remark, as a, this, this came to be because of a suggestion by... Um, uh, a chemist by the name of uh, Paul Daly, uh, who now works with the Alexander Shulgin Research Institute. Uh, he made a suggestion, the scientists that USONA picked up on it. Hmm. Uh, they published it. We've improved on that method. And so, you know, you build on the effort of other people and to come up with something that might then really lend itself to commercial scale production. You made me think of the Ray Dalio, uh, the famous hedge fund manager and best hedge fund that ever uh, has come about. And he said this quote that uh, any damn fool can make it complex. It takes a genius to make it simple. As you were talking about uh, the difficulty of making psilocybin, even though it is simple. Uh, I had Dennis McKenna on the show a couple of weeks ago and he said, it's, he said it, it may be the perfect molecule. And your point about it also being strangely similar or strangely simple, but it's uh, incredibly difficult to make, made me think of maybe it, was, it, it took some brilliance from nature to get it down to this perfect molecule. And that was part of the paradox of it's the simplicity, yeah. but also the complexity. Yeah. 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 Because psilocybin is actually not the active material it, it's metabolized in the body to psilocin and um, uh, you know psilocin is the active uh, metabolite um, and so but, but psilocin is also very unstable hmm. so you know if let's say the fungus made psilocin it's unlikely that it would have had the intended effect that you know nature somehow intends to have these things uh, useful for some purpose or other and you know it might be uh to hold off predators or 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 you know to prevent insects from eating them or uh you know so the, these molecules serve a function um but psilocin is unstable and so nature found a way to stabilize it and did that by phosphorylating it into psilocybin and psilocybin is an extremely stable molecule uh you know under produce psilocybin if it's very pure uh, as long as you keep it away from moisture and and uh, and uh, heat uh, it's incredibly stable got to transition to the soul search speed round peter this deep dive was uh, fascinating peter question number one what would you rather have somebody's curiosity or their attention i would rather have their curiosity I am with if they're you on curious, that one. I have their attention. Yes, yes. They might not be curious. They might pay attention, but not be curious. Okay, question number two. You get to relive the life, Peter, of any historical figure who you got. Ah, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> oh, that's a good answer. Okay, question number three, Peter. You are on a desert island for 10 years and you only get to bring one mind-altering substance with you and you are by yourself. Who you got? Um, oxygen. <laughs> well, let's say one that's not already there. Uh, uh, LSD. LSD. I had a feeling you might say that. Okay, last question. Number four, Peter. Who is one person that has had a tremendous impact on your career? Well, Nick Sand. Mm. I'm sure you might appreciate hearing that. Ladies and gentlemen, he is the Chief Science Officer of SciGen, Peter van der Heiden. Thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you, Ray. This, uh, it's a pleasure. I'm 
always happy to talk to you. You know, let's do it again.